So we've talked about the area moment of inertia and the polar moment of inertia. Now we want to talk about the mass moment of inertia. Just like area moments of inertia are beam bending and will be used a lot in solids, mass moments of inertia deal with rotational accelerations and they will be dealt with a lot in dynamics. Both of those topics end up being taught in statics because this integral looks just like all the other integrals we've been dealing with. So it makes sense to do it all at once. A mass moment of inertia works like this. If you consider any sort of mass, a potato with an axis running through it, and you start to twist it. Now let's assume that it can rotate, so it's not clamped down. If it can rotate and you start putting that Q on there, then it will begin to rotate. And as it begins to rotate, what we know is it takes a certain amount of time to get up to speed. So the time required to get this potato that's spinning around that axis up to a certain angular velocity is proportional to r squared times dm. And if we integrate that, we get the mass moment of inertia for an object. Its units are mass times length squared. So in metric units, that's just kilograms meter cubed, meter squared rather. In English units, remember that mass is given in slugs. So if you have pounds, you have to divide that to get out slugs feet squared. The measure of rotational inertia, that's what this is. This is a measure of rotational inertia. So the bigger I am gets, the longer it takes with a certain torque to get up to speed. If you get a very low rotational inertia, a very low mass moment of inertia, then it doesn't take very long to spin it up to speed. It spins easily. So, so where, where, does you, where would you ever use such a thing? A couple examples for you. The first one is the figure skater. If you're spinning around and you draw your arms in, then that r squared, the distance from the axis squared, you just shrunk it by a lot. And as you shrink that by a lot, your mass moment of inertia, I am, shrinks by a lot. So what that means is you will, in, if without additional torque, you're going to increase your rotational speed. A flywheel works the same kind of way. You want to keep all of the mass on the outside, where r squared is very large. And at that point, it spins and it keeps spinning. A helicopter autorotation is another wonderful one. A helicopter, if it loses power, will start to decelerate the rotor. But while it's still going around, it's still making lift. So what you want to do is have your rotor mass moment of inertia be high enough so that it spins long enough for you to get to the ground without killing yourself. So those are three sort of places where mass moment of inertia looks up here. This is our formula. There are Cartesian relations that make it more useful to calculate. If you look at, here's my mass, and it's at some distance away from the rotational axis. If I call that rotational axis z, then this dm could be r. I mean, this looks like the polar moment of inertia picture that we have. So what you can see is that at this point, r is equal to x squared plus y squared. So if I'm looking at specifically the z-axis, this is the integral of x squared plus y squared dm. And you can do the same thing for ix and iy. It's just, they're just different planes, but the same Pythagorean relationship. So if these are my two things, how does that work if you actually want to integrate it? So if I take this rectangular prism, it's just a block coming over onto the x-axis, the differential mass, remember mass is density times volume, so I have some density times the volume of my differential mass, which would be dx, dy, dz. That differential mass can go into my integral over here. Now, this is, there are three differentials here, so I have to do a triple integral. But if you set that all up, you've just got y plus z times rho, and I'm going to integrate x from 0 to l. I'm going to integrate y from negative h over 2 to h over 2 and z from negative b over 2 to b over 2. So these are, that, it's a fairly straightforward integral. And as you work it out, what you end up with is 1 12th row LHB times h squared plus b squared. Now, if you look at this, rho times LHB, that's the mass of the entire rectangular prism. So what you will see is, if you look this up in a chart, you will see 1 12th m, the entire mass of your object, times h squared plus b squared. If you look at it at the end, what we're saying is, as h and b get bigger, 
the rotational inertia about the x-axis gets bigger with a cube. There's a square here, and then there's one more in here. So as these, the mass gets farther and farther from that axis, your rotation takes longer and longer to spin up to speed.